Our Bible reading is found in Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 56. It's found on page 1588 of the Church Bibles. Page 1588, Luke 1, verses 39 to 56. Mary visits Elizabeth. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he has said to our fathers, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. This is God's word. We continue through Mary's unusual story and today look at the aspect of her uh, unashamed worship. We've considered her unexpected visitor, her unplanned pregnancy and now her response to that is her beautiful and unashamed worship. I want to thank Lily too for reminding us that through this whole story, this long story, that God is keeping his promises And it's those promises and those acts of a faithful God that Mary is able to call on in her own worship. So I wonder, when have you been so overwhelmed by something or so thankful for someone or so angry about something you just couldn't find the words to express how you were feeling? Am I the only one who's had that experience? Have you been there? I just feel something and I don't have the words to say it. Would it be helpful if you could find a way to have some phrases in your mind that would help you to express the way that you are feeling? Well, of course it would. And so then here's another question might be a little more difficult for some of us to answer. When have you been so overwhelmed by God that you just didn't have the words to express how you were feeling about that? When have you been so overwhelmed, so staggered, so amazed at what God has done for you that you wanted to express it and you just didn't have the words for it. Well, I think it's at this point that Mary's unusual story can connect 
so beautifully and so deeply with us. Most of Mary's story will be different to our own. None of us will, be ever, will ever be tasked with carrying the child in the way that Mary has been. But we might. We might find ourselves astonished at what God has asked us to do, at what God has blessed us with the opportunity to do, and we want the words to express that. We want to break out in worship of him. How will we do that? Well, Mary gives us, in it, gives us an example. It's a style of worship which has been used before and will be used again. It's not about music. It's not about lights. It's not about crowds. It's not about backdrops. It's about a young woman recognising God's justice and mercy in history and recognising God's mercy and kindness to her. Some of you, in hearing uh, Richard read out Mary's words, your mind might have gone back to when we were going through 1 Samuel and Hannah's response to God. When Hannah, finally, at last, by God's grace, had a son and the way that she glorified God. Both Hannah and Mary and others are using biblical themes that give a foundation to their prayer and worship. And therein lies an example for us to use biblical themes, biblical language that can give a foundation to our prayer and indeed to our worship. Mary declares that she will rejoice in and glorify God my Saviour. Beautiful. Mary is worshipping a God of mercy, noting what he has done for her. Mary is worshipping a God of justice, noting what God has done for his servants in the past and a confidence that God will do that in the future. And Mary is worshipping a God who remembers his people now and always. But all of that is because Mary can say of God, I have a saviour. I have a saviour. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. Now, if you have an outline in front of you, ignore it. Because what I have will not match that outline. You can cross out what's there and, and jot these words down. These are the main points of today. <clears throat> and if you forget everything else, grab hold of one of these statements. I have a saviour who cares for me. And I want to urge you to grab hold of that statement because there'll be a day when it's hard to, realize, hard to believe it. And you need to preach to yourself and remind yourself, I have a saviour who cares for me. For me, you have a saviour who cares for you. It's not just about you, though. I have a saviour who cares for his servants. I have a saviour who cares for me. I have a saviour who cares for his servants. And this is the only slide I've got today, really. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. Mary can say this. Mary can say of God, He knows me. He knows me. This is her testimony. In verse 48, he can, she can say, He has been mindful of my humble state. He has been mindful of the humble state of His servant. What brings her to that conclusion, though? What is it in Mary's life that can bring her to the conclusion that God is mindful of her even in her humble state. Well, we go back to the unexpected visitor and Gabriel's message to her when he said, Greetings, you who are, do you remember the words? Highly favoured. The Lord is with you. What a glorious thing to know and to have in your mind. Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. He even repeated it. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. 
Now, we enjoy finding favour with other people, being, uh, being well-liked, being respected. But how wonderful, how wonderful to know that you can find favour with God. Not because what you've done, but because of who God is, because God is keeping his promises. I wonder, if this is Mary's testimony, I wonder if this is your testimony too. If you can say of God, he knows me. The truth is, nobody knows you better than God does. God knows you better than you know yourself. And you might try to shield God and you know, God won't look at this and God doesn't understand that. But the reality is, God knows you better than you can know yourself. And no one can hide from God. And that just makes sense, because if God is truly God, it means that he can know you, that he does know you, and that you cannot stop yourself from being known by God. And if you want to respond to that by saying, if God, knew, if God really knew me, he'd know just how hopeless my life is. Then trust me when I say, I hear that and I understand that. But I'd want to respond to that by pointing to Mary who can say, he has been mindful of my humble state. He has been mindful of me in my humbleness. And by humbleness, we mean Mary's life was nothing special. She was just a girl living in just a town, just living her life. There was nothing spectacular about Mary. In fact, the more I've thought about this and the more I've pondered about God uh, lifting up the humble, I've I'm always come to the conclusion, and there's no specific basis for this, but I've almost come to the conclusion that Mary was probably just enormously plain. That Mary wouldn't stand out in a crowd. She wouldn't win a beauty contest. Mary was just Mary. But God knew her. And she was favoured. And God knows you in your humbleness, in your lowness, in your darkness, in your weakness. God knows you. And she can say, he has done great things for me. In verse 49, the mighty one has done great things for me. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Can't we all say, <coughs> can't we all say, I am blessed? There'll be some ways that we think we're not. But there's an old song that says, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And it's a good discipline to have, to count your many blessings. They are numerous. Mary can say, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. And to be honest, that sounds a little bit arrogant on its own, doesn't it? But it has a context. You see, back in verse 42, when Mary, <coughs> when Mary had arrived at Elizabeth's place, Elizabeth had already said to her, blessed are you among women. And it has a greater context than Elizabeth too. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. <coughs> Excuse me. For the mighty one has done great things for me. For the mighty one has done great things for me. No wonder she feels blessed. No wonder you feel blessed when you recognize the mighty things the mighty one has done for you. She hasn't earned this. She's been given this. And God is the giver. And she knows her place compared with God, <coughs> for he is greater. Excuse me. Mary knows her place compared to God. He is holy. And it's not just a name or a title. 
that, he sa- that Mary says he is called holy. <coughs> this is what God absolutely is. God is holy. And the God who is infinitely holy reaches down to Mary where she is. She's not en- making her way to Jerusalem. She's not seeking to ascend the hill of the Lord with a pure heart and clean hands. God reaches down to her where she is. And it's this same God that reaches down to us where we are and makes us clean. Now, we've heard about King David, the son of Jesse. And in Psalm 40, he writes this, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. Glory to God. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock. He gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. And what Mary is doing is what David has done. God will call me, or many will call me blessed because of what God has done and not trust me but fear God. Not look at me, but look at God. Isaiah is another who understood what it's like to be uh, confronted by the holiness of God who reaches down and confronts us with our sin. And he writes in his opening chapter, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Well, Mary knows this God. Not as a distant entity, not as a, an alien being, not as something that's out there somewhere. Mary knows this God as her saviour. <clears throat> and we all need a saviour. He's not just the God she's heard about around the table. Someone she's heard the teacher speak of. Mary knows God. And Mary knows God is interested in more than just her. So in her worship, she can worship God as a God who cares for her and for his servants. So she can say, I have a saviour who cares for me and I have a saviour who cares for his servants. Look at verse 50. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. What have we heard in our Jesse Tree story this morning? God is keeping his promises from generation to generation, from story to story, from prophet to prophet. God is keeping his promises and the story is unfolding as God is extending his mercy from generation to generation to those who fear him. And he's doing this in mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is not getting what we deserve. And so people, when they are, it may not happen so much now, but people when they are arrested or when they stand in olden times before a king, they would cry out for mercy. I deserve this, but I cry out for mercy. And here is mercy that is going through the generations, which means it is for those who have gone before. And so Mary can look back through the history of Israel and see the way that God has shown mercy to the generations before. But she can also then look ahead and see the way that God will show this mercy to the generations that are yet to come. One reason we have the children doing the nativity play is because we believe that the mercy of God is for the generations that are yet to come. You don't have to be 40. You don't have to be 56 to be, uh, to be accepted. It's generations through the generations through the generations. And God in his mercy shows his grace to each generation. And God shows justice. He cares for his servants in justice. And in verses 51 to 53, we have these beautiful poetic statements that show God 
lifting up and bringing down. And God in His justice will bring down people who need to be brought down. And so we should find confidence in this living God that this will happen. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. The Old Testament story of Nebuchadnezzar is a great and outstanding story of this happening. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, brought down, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. Now, God is a God who lifts up. And many of us, at times, need to be reminded of that. God is a God who lifts his people up. And when we are tired of of uh, an arrogant boss, uh, when we're tired of an overbearing school teacher, when we're uh, tired of government restrictions, and arrogance, then we remind ourselves that not only does God lift up, God brings down for his glory. And so we can pray with confidence, uh, confidence there. Warren Wearsby, uh, a marvellous commentator, some of you might know his work, he wrote this, Mary saw the Lord turning everything upside down. The weak dethrone the mighty, the humble scatter the proud, the nobodies are exalted, the hungries are filled, and the rich end up poor. The grace of God works contrary to the thoughts and ways of this world system. And how wonderful is it that the grace of God works contrary to this world system? Now here, I think Mary's picking up words and, and a style from the Old Testament, from Miriam and from Hannah, at least, and others. And this is why it's good to know the words of the Bible. It's good to know the Bible stories. It's good to know the Psalms. So that when we reach a point where we just want to express something of God, be it our frustration, be it our despair, be it our joy and delight, we have these words of Scripture within us to help us do that. And Miriam was able to do that when the people had left Egypt and gone through the Red Sea. Miriam, tambourine in hand, sang out, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord brings down the proud. And Hannah, when she'd had her son after many years of praying and weeping, said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. There is no one holy like the Lord. And again, this lifting and bringing down. The bows of the warrior are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry hunger no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, and she who has had many sons pines away. And if this is how God acts, if this is how God acts, the lifting up the humble and bringing down the proud, then we shouldn't be at all surprised that the promise given to a little town called Bethlehem is this. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, one whose origin is from of old, from ancient times. How glorious that God lifts up. And nor should we be surprised that it was the shepherds who first heard the message of the Saviour. God is lifting up the humble. God is caring for his servants in mercy and in justice and in eternity. And in the way she concludes uh, her comments here, He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. So we can look back and see what God has done. You can look back in your life and see what God has done. 
Can you remember a moment now? Can you picture a moment in your mind where you could look back and say, here was where God showed mercy to me. Here was where I I saw God act in justice. Here is where I saw God lift me up. And it might not be as spectacular as as, uh, Joseph and and, uh, Pharaoh's dreams. It might not be as dramatic as Mary and Jesus. But do you remember that moment when you were lifted up? You can look back. Because we have the Bibles in our hand, we can look back and see the way that God has done that in the past. That God has been merciful to Abraham. That God has shown mercy and justice to his people. But we don't have to just look back. We can look ahead and see what God will yet do. And Mary was clearly able to do that. We come into the next part of the the first chapter of Luke's Gospel and we see the way that Zechariah speaks when he's able to speak again and he worships God and he looks ahead to what his son will be and what his son will do. Leon Morris writes, Mary is saying that God's action in the Messiah is not so much completely new as a continuation of his mercy to Abraham. It's not new, it's continuing. Mary knows God, her saviour. Mary knows that this God is not just her saviour, but the saviour of his people. And if Mary knows that, how can she not worship? And if you know that, how can you not worship such a God? And with the words of Mary in our mind, we are encouraged to find those words. And so we can say, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour. I have a Saviour who cares for me. And though I struggle to find the words at times, I can take those for myself. I hope you can too. I hope you too can take those words. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour. For he has been mindful of me. The humble state of his servant. May you know the glory of God now and always as he lifts you up when you need that. And maybe as he brings you down if you need that too. Let's pray. Our loving Lord God, we thank you that you are, wow, we thank you for your wonder, we thank you for your grace, we thank you for your care, we thank you for your story, this story that is so old, that is so long, uh, that we can look back on and find such encouragement in as we see you keeping your promises again and again and again. And thank you that the story hasn't completely ended, that we still share in that story as it's continuing to unfold. Oh Lord, we long for your return. But until then, Father, may you continue to glorify us. Sorry, may you continue to glorify yourself through us. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. And amen. Get that right. We're going to sing the last two verses of Once in Royal David City. And I'll ask you to stand this time as we 